Good evening and um, welcome to the Planning Applications Committee. Our point of substance, please. Thank you very much for some suggestions. Mm. Uh, Declaration of peculiar interest. Uh, my children have been intimate and members of uh, London Market Club, so I won't be commenting on that. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, for, for the <coughs> information, um, this is how we um, operate in planning. The officers will present reports to us, and then we will ask objectors who will be given three minutes each. If I think tonight there's going to be a group of three who are going to have two minutes each. <coughs> The agent will then have the equivalent amount of time to respond. Once that happens, uh, we'll go back to officers, is there any issues that need picking up? And then we move to members who will take questions and <coughs> comment on the reports. At that point, uh, the public are not allowed to intervene. If you are speaking, we have a traffic light system here. The traffic light, when it gets to amber, means uh, that you have one minute left if you're on the three minute cycle. But I think. Um, Lisa will come out for the two minutes cycle. Those people <coughs> who are affected by that will, will know who I'm talking to. Um, the order of the agenda tonight, um, with your permission, members, is um, first of all, can I say that the item 6141 Broadway is not on this uh, agenda tonight, it's been removed. Um, so we will take the Wimbledon Rugby Club um, item first, which is agenda item. Um, Five, um, and then we will take uh, the Hartfield Road Hotel, which is that agenda item um, nine, and then the Wimbledon Stadium agenda item eleven, and then the rest of the uh, agenda will follow as it is um, in your report. Oh, sorry, thirteen. Sorry, thirteen, um, which is the fifty-two, fifty-four, one way will follow the Wimbledon Stadium and then the rest will uh, be in the agenda rule. So that's, um, I hope that's okay with everybody. So we will be pre beginning with agenda item 5, which is the Wimbledon Rugby Club, and I'll hand over to officers to present. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, the application site outlined here is to the west of Barham Road and to the north of Preston Road in Wimbledon. The site currently comprises several playing fields. The site is designated as metropolitan open land and tracks out in the conservation areas located to the east. The proposal itself is for the installation of an asterisk turf pitch specific to rugby and the erection of six floodlight columns, fence around and storage container. The asteroid turf pitch would replace an existing rugby pitch but be repositioned further south by 17 metres when measured to the edge of the tarmac standing area for the proposal and the east by 8 metres. The pitch would be set back to the ground which results in the pitch being raised up at the western end and set into the ground at the eastern end. This would be achieved with an actual grass bank, a 1.2 metre high fence would surround the pitch along the tarmac standing area for supporters and officials. A storage container is proposed in the northeast corner for equipment, and six floodlight columns are proposed, each at 15 metres in height, and they'll be sighted down the sides of the, of the proposed pitch. So, briefly talking through that. So, um, you see the outside of the pitch where the squiggles are, that is showing the land, where the land uh, banks come down. So, on this side, they'll actually they'll drop down to the pitch, on this side, they'll be raising up to the pitch. The storage container is here. Access to the so rugby club pavilion is here, um, and existing car park is here. Emergency vehicle access is also proposed here to the pitch from the existing car park. <coughs> this is just a closer up um, version. Uh, in terms of the floodlights, <coughs> there are three on each side um, facing in to the pitch. This is the section plan. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the laying it flat within the pitch, uh, flat surface, uh, this is due to the difference in grading, um, which slopes down from east to west across the site. So at this end here, for example, this is the pavilion end. Uh, this end is the other end. Over here again, the pavilion end. 
So that'll be the view from the rear. Um, plug lighting is, is proposed. Um, this is a plug light spillage plan which accompany the application. Um, the nearest residential properties are here. These are the ends of the gardens here. This is the floodlight column, for example, um, 50 metres high. They are collapsible, um, as shown here. Uh, the top of pitch proposed, um, so it's designed for rugby, so it's um, got longer grass than, for example, a hockey pitch. Um, also soft underfoot. Uh, this example of the top of pitch surface and sort of fencing that will be used within the scheme. Um, also a storage container as well. Um, and this is an example of the plug lights um, that I propose, um, just really helping it show into a bit of context. In terms of site pictures, uh, this is the road leading up to the entrance of the car park for the rugby club. That's the pavilion building on the left there. This is the car park, um, further park into the east. Um, just beyond here is the existing pitch. Uh, this is the existing pitch here. As I said, it's not replacing it light for light in terms of position. It is moving further this way. So this just gives you a bit of an idea of the, the site and surrounding area. As I said earlier, um, sports fields existing. There are some existing lighting flood light columns um, on the pitch of the far side there. Looking back, um, this is the pavilion here. So the pitch would be moving east this way. Um, as you can see, the closest living property here, you see the rear elevation. Um, on a different day on the site visit, um, showing the, the three closest residential properties here. Just a wider view, really.
read out that there is recording um, happening at the moment in this chamber. Uh, the meeting is recorded for subsequent broadcast on the council's website and therefore by participating in the meeting you're consenting to being recorded and to the use of those sound recordings for broadcasting and all training purposes as these cannot be removed post recording. <coughs> if you have any queries regarding these please speak to one of the council staff um, after the meeting. For contact. Toilets, the public toilets on the ground floor are currently closed for refurbishment. So there are public and disabled toilets in the library. If you go through the cafe seating area to where a security guard will direct you. I'm going to um, move to our objectives now. We've got three people. Um, wishing to use up the six minutes, and I've got Joanna Leake, Jane Watkins, and Annabelle Graham Paul. So I'm taking Joanna Leake first. Joanna Leake? Yeah. Okay. About two minutes. It's a little silver bar. Yeah. Thank you. The London Plan affords metropolitan open lands the same protection as the Green Belt. National policy requires Green Belt land to be permanently open and considers development as inappropriate with limited exactness including appropriate um, can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Um, including appropriate facilities for sport. The emphasis here is on appropriate. Specifically proposals need to preserve openness. The eight thousand square metre pitch with one point two metre white fencing and one and a half metre banks will have an adverse impact on the openness due to its location right in the centre of the open space. It reduces access across the space from 140 metres wide to just two and a half metres wide. This, in combination with tarmac path, storage, advertisements, flood lighting, can have huge impacts to the openness. Why has no visual impact assessment been provided by the applicant? A verified view would show the clear encroachment of the openness. As a chartered town planner of over 15 years' experience, I don't understand how the officers have been able to make a robust assessment without this crucial information. The officers' report even states that proposals would have some impact on the current open character, and the refusal of a much less obtrusive credit pitch in 2016 begs the question as to why this is being put forward for approval. Using community benefits as an exception to green bar policy in this case is unjustified. Club members may benefit, but this does not outweigh the harm to the open space and loss of openness for all other users and the wider community. Dividing the open space with this pitch erodes the edge of the MOL, leaving a disjointed parcel of land to the south, separating it from the main body of the MOL and the Northern Common. Given the level of protection afforded to the site's preservation at every single level of planning policy, it's clearly not enough evidence to allow officers and members to make a robust assessment of its impacts. The technical design note of 30th of February was uploaded very late on 11th of March without formal notification, leaving no time for residents to fully scrutinise it. We simply not had time to take it on board and prepare a response. This application should not be determined tonight because members and residents have not had time to fully look at it and we consider we are prejudiced if a decision is made tonight. No travel plan is provided despite a request from the highways officer. In terms of sustainability and future planning, why are there no measures proposed to reduce single car occupancy? The hope for additional spectators to higher level matches has not been taken into account. How will parking be monitored long term? How is active transport encouraged? The PTAL is zero. 
The aim is for a more intense use of the 3G pitch. Transport statements should cover worst case scenarios. The date of the parking survey was chosen by the rugby club itself. Parking capacity will fall short. Informal overspill parking of 10 cars in the January report stretched to 178 parking on the grass MOL in September, demonstrating the site does not have the capacity to operate at increased levels without some significant adverse impacts. Private streets cannot be considered as parking capacity. A true reflection of traffic flow is not addressed. The narrow roads have no pavements for the safety of pedestrians, residents and cyclists. The officer looks at Saturday with movements in the region of one trip every 12 minutes. But in the data for Sunday between 9 and 10 a.m., car park 2 alone goes from 0 to 41 parked cars, uh, averaging one trip per 1.4 minutes. It doesn't take account of drop-offs or congestion as they return. On traffic generation, a model trip rate is used for a five-a-side team times three, ignoring drop-off spectators, substitutes, coaches, medical staff, netball players. Sorry, Why? Jane, I'm going to have to stop you. Okay, can I move to Annabelle? Please, Graham, Paul. Annabelle, you're on mute. Thank you. I speak on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Bell, uh, who live at 54 Barnard Road, the house closest to the development. I will speak first regarding the previous decision to refuse planning permission for a non-turf cricket practice pitch at the site in December 2016. As you will be aware, as a matter of law, previous decisions are material planning considerations and the Council's determination of this application should be consistent with previous decisions. The Council refused the cricket pitch application on the basis that the pitch would result in the loss of grassland and the pitch and associated netting would be detrimental to the character of the metropolitan open land. Residents see no difference between that and the harm caused by the current proposal to remove grassland and intrude in mole with flood lighting. Officers have not considered the similarities with the previous decision reached and I would urge members to take this into account and act consistently. Second, there are a number of procedural flaws which in my submission would vitiate the grant of planning permission tonight. The first is the late transport information which residents have not had the opportunity to review properly. It is crucial to the acceptability of the scheme. The second is the number of pieces of essential information missing from the application as Mr and Mrs Bell have set out in their objection prepared by DWD planning consultants. In addition, and more fundamentally, the proposed flood lighting and fence do not fall within the definition of a building or engineering operations, and thus these, by virtue of not falling within any of the defined exceptions in MPPF paragraphs 145 and 146, must be deemed inappropriate development. This too has not been considered by officers. Furthermore, there have been a number of recent appeal decisions where inspectors have found flood lighting harms openness. Any harm to openness, no matter how limited, is harmful and therefore inappropriate development. There are no very special circumstances in this case. I would thus urge members to refuse planning permission tonight or adjourn the application pending further consideration. Thank you. Um, can I call on Rick Bruin and Meg Gardner? Are you going to share the six minutes you have? Or are you three? <coughs> three. three. Good evening, my name is Rick Bruin. I'm the Area Facilities Manager for the Rugby Football Union. I'm speaking in support of the application for an artificial grass pitch at Wimbledon RFC. The proposal at Wimbledon RFC is part of the National RFU Rugby 365 Artificial Grass Pitch Programme. The investment into the programme is driven by the desire to provide high quality services at community accessible venues all year round that will improve the playing experience for all participants. The programme has undertaken a national strategic analysis of sites that satisfy and contribute to the following criteria. A free hold or a long lease site that will be able to offer the RFU a 30 year lease on the pitch, as the RFU would operate the pitch via a facility management agreement. <coughs> the national programme of AGP delivery <coughs> seeks to increase match and training capacity in areas where natural turf pitches are overused. The programme also aims to improve the quality and consistency of the training provision across the country. 
The National Strategic Analysis examined pitch capacity in terms of quality and quantity around the proposed sites to identify need. The results of this analysis are in agreement with the emerging data within the latest London Borough of Merton playing pitch strategy, as well as supporting recommendations for the enhancement of pitch quality and provision of artificial services. The proposal is identified as having no detrimental impact on the character or openness of the metropolitan open land. NPPF paragraph 89 states that an exception to inappropriate <coughs> development in the Greenbelt is provision of appropriate facilities for outdoor sport, outdoor recreation, and for cemeteries as long as it preserves the openness of the Greenbelt and does not conflict with the purposes of including land within it. The proposals are for the upgrade of existing facilities at the site. It is considered that there will be no detrimental impact on the openness of the MOL as a result of these proposals, given the location of the new AGP adjacent to the existing pavilion and the provision of existing flood lighting to the west of the site. The proposed fencing has been designed to be as unobtrusive as possible given it is half open face mesh and 1.2 metres high. The proposed flood lighting is narrow and will therefore have very limited visual impact. The principle of other RFU Rugby 365 projects being acceptable in other areas of Greenbelt and M MOL is well established. For example, another Rugby 365 application within London Borough of Hounslow at Chiswick Rugby Club was approved in February 2018. This application site was also within MOL land. The case officer for the application found the proposed pitches and pavilions constitute appropriate development within the MOL on the basis that it consists of appropriate facilities of outdoor sport with a built form which helps maintain the openness of the site. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Meg Gardner, the Honorary Secretary at Wimbledon RFC, and I'm speaking today in support of the application by the RFU to install an artificial grass pitch and AGP at Wimbledon. Wimbledon RFC has been playing rugby on Wimbledon Common since 1865 and on our current ground since the 1950s. We are a community sports club providing a high level of community engagement and social good in Merton. We provide a range of adult and children's sport for both males and females, not just rugby, netball and athletics as well. And we are one of a small number of clubs in the country to run a thriving inclusive rugby section for children with special educational needs. Wimbledon also runs Wimbledon in the Community, which was established to give greater focus to our social responsibilities. The programme allows local maintained school children to experience a high level of rugby coaching, which they otherwise would not have access to. The AGP would help to improve the delivery of Wimbledon's community engagement by having access to a pitch that can be used in all weathers. The better surface will encourage greater participation in healthy activity and will ensure fair access for all. This would be the same not just for Wimbledon, but for plenty of other clubs and schools in Merton. It has been demonstrated through technical studies submitted as part of the application that this proposal will not cause any unacceptable impact on the existing parking and transport situation on site, and it will not increase peak usage at Wimbledon. It is simply replacing an already used existing pitch, in particular the pitches used on a Sunday morning already to capacity. Floodlit training already takes place at Wimbledon on Mondays to Thursdays from 7 to 9.30 p.m. for the club's senior men's and women's teams, from St George's Hospital, and from St John's Leatherhead Old Boys team. It has been demonstrated that the application will have no detrimental impact in terms of light spill or noise. The operational restriction in the planning application that the pitch will not be used past 10 p.m. and earlier on a Sunday helps to assist with this. This view is supported by the Merton Environmental Health Officer. Although no pre-application was undertaken, both the RFU and Wimbledon have fully engaged with Merton and our local community, including completing a number of additional <coughs> technical studies to support the application, all of which are supported by Merton officers. Wimbledon also organised a valuable meeting between residents, Wimbledon RFC, the RFU and Stephen Hammond MP to discuss the rationale behind the application. As shown in a large number of supporting statements submitted, the installation of an AGP would be an incredible investment in Merton, and also as a local resident of Rains Park Ward, 
I think the area is lucky to have been identified as worthy of this investment. Yes, the, uh, the cricket nets, um, they were proposed um, over here, uh, this part of the site. Um, so um, they weren't placed in particularly an existing pitch. Um, they're a brand new facility on the site. Um, with this particular proposal before us, because um, we're placing an existing pitch, um, which will allow all year round participation uh, and actually enhance the existing pitch facility and existing sports. In the existing sports fields context, um, we've determined that this particular case um, can be supported. Um, whereas that cricket nets um, well, consult with RFU, what are the worst scenarios during the times. And these are the times they had set as the peak times um, were the worst cases. So that on that basis, we, the consultant, has uh, taken the hours as a 9 to 15 on a Sunday, 9 to and a weekend, and the uh, weekdays are 2 to 8 o'clock. Those are the times that RFU say that the worst case. Were the residents ever asked at what time they seem to think are the worst case? Because <coughs> this seems as almost biased towards the, the, the rugby club rather than the residents, who probably know better when it gets worse for them. That does it. After 8 o'clock, at the most of the traffic disappears. After 8 o'clock, that's the worst, that's the minimum. So they are not taking the maximum capacity of the usage of the parking within the site. So the residents were consulted about what times the traffic service should be carried out? Um, I, I, I'm not aware of that. No. Are there any other questions, Councillor? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, there's talk about MRL. I wonder if there's any, any idea at all what percentage of the MRL this pitch will take up, as it seems to be. Uh, my understanding of the MRL is clearly not what's reflected here. Um, I just wondered if we had any idea of that sort of percentage. Uh, we don't have percentage figures on hand now. <laughs> don't have percentage uh, figures on hand now. Cast me in. 
What issues raised by residents was the uh, lack of in involvement in the parking survey and the delay, the lateness of it? <laughs> Could the officers respond to that? Why that happened or if it happened? Uh, yeah, so the parking survey um, came out from our, um, our Huawei's team. Um, we're looking at the application, um, realised it wasn't an up to date parking survey that had been undertaken. So it was a, um, it's a document, what, a technical request uh, to inform Huawei's officers' views. Um, um, so we felt we didn't need to consult, re consult on that. Um, so that, that is why. So the consultation is done quite recently then, so that the information can be passed on. Um, yeah, so there was, there was a delay in, in getting on the website, um, so it's being reviewed by our highway sources. Um, but, um, but as I said, in forming a te technical opinion, um, we didn't um, include these three consultants. Any other questions, Council team? Thank you, Major. Uh, can I ask, uh, do they do cars park on the grass at the moment and, and um, mark the wardens views at any time? Uh, I don't know if parking wardens are uh, in operation with the proper top. Um, I have seen pictures and representations of, of cars, being, they are. They are. Cars, cars being parked on the grass. So yes, we have seen pictures of cars being parked on the grass. people's usage of that, i.e. use it all the time rather than once it wears. <laughs> and the, the problem is, uh, going back to the cricket pitch, if a, if a committee decision was to um, not to allow the cricket pitch, which already takes up more space, but is much easier, on the eye and on the environment, why do we expect um, to actually find a, a rugby pitch, artificial rugby <coughs> pitch, because all sports clubs are struggling but at the lower levels, and it is a good idea to have artificial, but I find it odd that a committee would turn down a cricket pitch and we might support this, it's quite odd. Um, all I can say is that they are, um, they are different. Um, this cricket scheme, there are there are a significant number of benefits um, to the proposal um, all year round use, um, encouraging sport, out of sport and recreation. Um, the main uses of this pitch is going to be the, the, the rugby club. Um, so um, yeah, we do think there are there are benefits in this case. Just um, got permission. <coughs> So I think it just seems sensible when the, the teams are playing at home, 
those are the busiest times for the club. Um, I'm changing it to an all weather pitch rather than, um, yes, it will hopefully mean more use of the pitch throughout the year, but it's still one rugby pitch. You cannot hold two matches on the same rugby pitch at the same time. It would hopefully mean fewer matches are called off because of water logging pitch or any of the other um, reasons you might have to call a match off because of the pitch um, during winter weather. So it won't mean more people at the rugby club at one time. We're replacing one pitch with another pitch. It just means fewer matches will be called off and have to be rearranged and it just makes the effective running of the rugby club um, easier, I would expect. Um, I'm across the board entirely will always support better sporting provision for all the people in Merton. This is, in, this is not building a new pitch, this is replacing a pitch with a better pitch. Um, and I don't see any good reason to, to as from all the things in the, in the officer's documents, I can't see any good reason to turn it down. Councillor Sarkic, did you put your hand up to speak? Uh, no. No, I saw you wave, but I thought you were going to. Are there any other comments, please? Yeah, Councillor Sarkic. Yeah. The, uh, yes, yeah, so quite a different attack on this, but I've looked at the, you know, the views of the, the common conservatives who are after perhaps the most closely affected stakeholders in terms of the impact of this on the, the, the openness of the site. And I noticed that they are by and large content, um, subject to some comments on the hours in which floodlights might, might operate. Um, I mean, there might be questions as to whether floodlights should operate till 10, but that apart, I, I attach quite a lot of weight to their view. Are there any other comments? No? In that case, I'm going to move to the vote. Those in favour of the application, please show. Those against, and not voting, then the recommendation is approved. We can move on to agenda item 9, which is 27 to 39, half the mm -hmm. Season for 
uh, and there's a tree myth example, which will come forward, or people generally walking through underneath on the way up to the um, station. First of all, as the two of units benefit from the first floor, and it's the main hotel reception and lobby area. And then the second floor above, it is the hotel rooms, um, obviously including uh, the lifts, stairs, and living sections. Um, you'll see the outlook from each room, face to face, obviously out to the front and onto the sides. Um, outlook is, is restricted uh, to the west. Um, it's the third floor, it's the same fourth floor. You'll see as you go higher, the roof is um, the set back. Sixth floor, seventh floor, and an eighth floor plant compound. <coughs> Turn to the elevations. Uh, proposed front elevation, the building will have double height ground floor frontage set back on supporting columns, including full height glazing. The columns will be exposed brick columns. Across the floors will be a green uh, coloured banding separating each floor. The main material for each floor will be exposed brick, which are these, and some feature bricks on the corners. Um, which are supposed to be a green colour, but they would be um, all part of the materials condition submitted to us. The top floor and plant will be enclosed in an aluminium panel roof, here and here. Uh, the window frames will be dark bronze in colour <coughs> and anthracite grey to the glazing ground floor level. The proposed rear, the um, so the will be facing brick, uh, but also with the roof materials to match the front. Um, you'll note that the windows have been restricted. These are the two closest uh, elevations coming towards um, projects on Graham Road. Um, turning to the sides, uh, this is a view of the road. <coughs> you can just see the overhang here. And staggering as it goes back. View from Graham Road. Projects on Graham Road again, staggered up. Should be noted that it's, it's slower down height than the office building to the north. Um, the road naturally slopes slopes up, so it takes up standard formation. This is a further detail plan showing first sure up detail really the elevations and the materials. And the section drawing as well from Brown Road. Uh, streets and plans, so office building here, further up Hartfield Road. Um, we have another office building here, lower down, on Hartfield Road. So it is obviously clearly a much bigger building than existing, um, but it does face Hartfield Road and other commercial buildings of similar size. Uh, the flat roof elements of the building are supposed to be green roofs, um, with natural planting. Some additional planting is also provided down the side of the building, with three trees. Um, and the applicant submitted some 3D sketches with the submission um, just to assist with the um, members' determination this evening. So, view from the Hollywood Road looking south, <coughs> you see the colonnades here. And the double height entrance, this just helps show how that hotel lobby would work, for example. Um, so, the first one is the girls. And look down to the entrance, <laughs> into the lifts. Uh, turning to some site photographs. Um, so, this is looking at the site here on the Hartfield Road. And again, here. Um, building heights, so obviously it is lower down than this building here in terms of height. Uh, Beacon Graham Road, so the site starts here. Going this way. On Beulah Road, looking back, just mm -hmm. the building there. Um, this is the closest residential uh, flats to the to the scheme, which is set at the back. The nearest elevation proposed at the rear wouldn't go beyond this elevation here. So that's just to help assist that. So members attention now to the mod sheet. Um, 
page three, so you'll see that the um, men of power of 6.3, uh, where we did receive men of plans and did a full reconsultation and some additional um, objections there, in summary, and some letters of support, and some additional, uh, additional condition 37, and amending condition 34. Uh, members overall, proposal would provide a new building of larger scale than existing. The new building would provide replacement ground for units with appropriate flexible town centre uses. The scale of formal design buildings to be suitable for the site and surrounding area. The proposed hotel and ground floor uses would benefit from an on-site servicing access road. The design and scale of proposals would be designed to ensure the greatest spot and mass front smart hill road itself. The design review panel gave a green verdict for the building's design prior to submission. And officers during the grant application have sought improvements to proposals to achieve a high quality design. Council's local plan policy support hotel provision in towns and locations such as this site. <coughs> officers therefore recommend permission be granted such conditions and a section one scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you um, can I call on Lily Kotsana, please? Dear councillors, this application has attracted extensive opposition on several different grounds, calling for it to be rejected. What I would like to specifically focus on this evening is safety. It is currently proposed that Graham Road will be used as an exit point for all the service vehicles that will be servicing the site. As for the planning officer's recommendation, such access will be permitted between 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. 24-7 all year round. What we can't see from the proposal or the recommendation is what analysis has been carried out on the safety risks arising from this use and more importantly, how these risks are addressed. Let me give you some quick facts about Graham Road. It is a feeder road for two large primary schools, Dundonald and Wimbledon Chase. It is flooded with young children. Please just look at the photos that I've submitted. The number of young children seen walking or scootering along Graham Road on a daily basis is simply overwhelming. It is a quiet and narrow residential road and at the moment the safest route into town for young families. Despite all of these facts, the plans, and sadly also the recommendation, fail to acknowledge the serious safety risks inherent in this proposal, not to mention address them. How has the Council satisfied itself that the core strategy policies 18 and 20 relating to safety have been complied with? What steps have been taken or conditions imposed to ensure that the safety of pedestrians including young children, will not be compromised. The recommendation expediently assumes that every truck exiting the site will naturally choose to turn left towards the city centre. This is not correct, as any trucks with a destination towards east or south will be guided to drive through Graham Road. It also states that there will be a condition for vehicles to be encouraged to turn left. There should be enforcement and not encouragement. It assumed that only three to four vehicles a day would serve as the site. How is this substantiated? At the moment, there is no indication of the nature of the retail stores that will form part of the development. So making an assumption of their servicing needs is ill thought out. More importantly, it is assumed that there are no other solutions. This is simply not enough. The evident lack of an appropriate safety analysis and mitigation plan, together with the other objections raised by residents, call for this application to be rejected. Even if this application is passed, which we sincerely hope will not be the case, it needs to be sufficiently conditioned so as to protect the safety of the local residents and, more importantly, young children. At the very minimum, the plan should consider appropriate alternatives which don't involve the use of Graham Road, for example, an on-site service Van Beulah Road, Reduce the servicing hours so they don't coincide with peak or school hours and don't affect people's sleep. And if access to Graham Road is to be permitted, which we hope won't be the case, impose a left turn onto Hoffley Road and require the use of the gated mechanism to ensure that vehicles exit slowly. The recommendation falls short of this at the moment. This is an accident waiting to happen. Thank you for your consideration. This application is repeating planning mistakes of the past, and we are fed up, the people of Merton are fed up, that Merton Council continues to turn our communities and streets into cold, bland, piled up slabs in our names. New local and national planning policy is being drafted and passed to stop this kind of approach. You also need to reject this application on height, mass, scale and design. It contravenes so many policies I have to send them by email. 
Is this the right place for such a big hotel? Perhaps a smaller, lower in height, more character hotel, perhaps. But this is no such thing. Big hotels mean big servicing needs. Beulah Road is a narrow one-way track of a modest one-way system. Hotel traffic would feed into Graham Road, a quiet residential crescent with family homes dealing with young children. We're told that three to four servicing trucks are needed every single day from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., including public holidays. The Premier Inn loads from the bus lane on the Broadway, not from the residential road behind, and this aspect alone should re uh, be a reason for refusal. My other concerns are there are no computer-generated images whatsoever connected to this application to show how a 29-metre tower right in the heart of Wimbledon Town Centre, 10 seconds walk away from the low-rise conservation area which runs parallel, will impact the town. What about the impact on the residential nature of Graham Road with its two-storey houses? The setback at the fourth floor from the drawings looks very shallow and the Solus proposal with its short, sharp, saw-like edges will dominate and degrade the existing character. But what about the visual aspect of this proposal? What is the design? When I asked the developer what is Wimbledon, he cited planners had indicated the fridge on the bridge and Pinnacle House, the two worst towers, structures in Wimbledon, perfect examples of what not to do. The planning officers are basing the height of this hotel on the now out-of-character Pinnacle House. Pinnacle House began as a five-storey red brick Art Deco building. It's not a new build, but a reclad, and when extended by three storeys, it became Wimbledon's tallest building at 34 metres, painted black, mausoleum-like, cold, causing horrible wind issues. The design would create another white elephant ripping out the heart of Wimbledon. White buff brick will get grimy with all the carbon particulate sharp edges and a concave facade with repetitive windows is very similar to this building we're sitting in, the civic centre, which is an eyesore. The colonnades dominate and still instil a sense of safety, especially at night on Dundonald Ward's most crime-affected street, GBH, drug dealing. The hotel sits opposite a large bar. The hotel reception is still on the first floor, despite police advice that it should be at ground level due to drug dealing and prostitution. There's just too much wrong with this and nothing right. I urge you to refuse permission and send the applicant back to the drawing board. The planners are promoting an abstract vision of what should be, but rather than the natural way that we see this space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight in support of this application. My name is Will Rowley and I'm from Reef Room. Before you tonight is a vote of confidence in your borough. This is a £50 million investment in Wimbledon. It will create up to 150 new jobs, as well as providing a significant boost to the range and quality of visitor accommodation in the borough. Councillors, this application has been submitted to fit the requirements of your emerging local plan. In that plan, this site is allocated as a hotel and retail. We have listened long and hard to what local people and your officers had to say over the last three years about our plans, and as a result, we have evolved the scheme into what is before you tonight. People were concerned about the height of the building. We have ensured that the height is lower than the next door Pinnacle House. Indeed, it is some five and a half metres lower than the Pinnacle House, which is greater than the size of a double-decker bus. Your officers have stated that the height is acceptable and that the building would not be visually overbearing. An appropriate transition between buildings either side, paragraph 7.2.8. The building is of a high quality design, paragraph 7.2.10. Your design review panel gave this scheme a green light. Concerns were raised about the servicing and delivery arrangements exiting onto Bueller Road. We held long discussions with the officers and revised delivery and servicing arrangements to remove potential conflicts in response from local residents and businesses. To confirm, vehicles will exit the site turning left onto Graham Road and then left onto Hartfield Road. We have listened to comments about the proposed materials for the side panels and have decided to replace the originally planned mustard yellow panel with a more expensive coloured feature brick. Some were concerned about the aesthetics of the roof, flat roof, so we changed the design on the Hartfield Road elevation to the curved roof to better enhance the street scene. 
We will also be providing new commercial units as well. Councillors, as you will see, have seen Diana Stark, the CEO of your Chamber of Commerce, has written in support of the application. She emphasises how this scheme will support the economy of the town centre. We have striven to make this 177-bed hotel environmentally friendly. We have built into the design both green roofs and photovoltaic panels. We have taken advantage of the town centre location with its excellent key town rating of 6B to make the development car free, which will further reduce any environmental impact. We will achieve and exceed Brianne very good. Some people have commented about the treatment of the existing tenants. In fact, the existing tenants are more than happy with the deals agreed. It is true to say that the application would not be before you tonight if landowners and tenants alike had not willingly participated. Councillors, tonight you can vote to have a vibrant, thriving town centre, a place where new jobs and investment occurs, a place where visitors want to stay and spend money. Please support this scheme and vote in line with your office's re recommendation to approve. Thank you. Um, just pick up a few points really. Obviously, design mass scale um, of the building, that is a, um, is a judgment, um, a judgment we have to make. Uh, the design has been designed to stagger down as the road falls away from uh, north to south. Um, the design, they have been to design re review panel before submitting the application, uh, which is encouraged by us, uh, getting a green light on its design. In terms of servicing, the original application did propose servicing just off Beulah Road as per existing. Um, <coughs> following discussions with highways officers, um, it was considered better to actually create a through road through to help get the vehicle and uh, service vehicles off the main road, Beulah Road. <coughs> you have Champion Timber opposite, which does pose difficulties with a large uh, vehicle um, coming in and out of, of that. Um, Delivery and servicing um, plan submitted indicates that vehicles will be coming out and turning left <coughs> on Brave Road. Um, the staggered nature of the building, um, we think it's good design, um, stacking it away from sensitive properties to the, to the west. So it's possible there could be more or less vehicles each day servicing the site. 
Uh, and he also told me that uh, the, the servicing plan uh, isn't enforced as such. Um, so I'd like to draw the committee's attention to condition 32 set out in the officer's report, which is lim the limitation of service vehicles between 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. So residents in your packs here, as you've got in the residence here tonight, mentioned uh, the number of parents and children using Graham Road. It's the main cut through to Wimbledon Town Centre, uh, as well as local schools and nurseries, and mornings are a key time. Uh, similarly, you'll see from your pack local businesses on Mueller Road, Waterfall Garage, uh, Garages, Champion Tim, uh, Timber have raised concerns because their main times for customers uh, are early in the mornings. Um, and on this evidence, and on the basis of DMT 5A, I'd okay. like, uh, if the committee is minded to approve, which uh, they said uh, I think there are reasons not to, if it is minded to approve, that you look again at condition 32 on the hours of service operation, which I believe is an option open to you. Uh, and also, again, to uh, any limitation on the right-hand turn onto Graham Road, uh, which would drive traffic back through uh, a residential road and a pedestrian area. Thank you very much for your consideration. Questions? Councillor Beagle. This was mentioned that this had been to the design review panel. Can you tell me how many times it was there? Legally can stop that large vehicle 
going down the road, but what does it do from there? Either it breaks the law, what it does, it just, you'll have to break the law. So what I'm asking is what are officers, transport officers, going to do about that? Uh, the reason, as I said before, the service, service access is made to the rear of the property or development. And that avoids having to make a turn on Builder Road or carry on further down on, down on the road where the restrictions are. So it's highly unlikely the heavy goods vehicle will, will negotiate that road. So, so, I'm so sorry to keep passing on, on this show. So um, does the taxi park, can a taxi park in the bus lane in front? There's no parking between the bus lane and the service road on Pula Road. So if the taxi parks in the service road, what is the lorry to do? The service road, is it enough space for two cars, for a lorry and a taxi, or not? I'm trying to understand what a lorry does when it is stuck, because it can't go forward, it can't go backwards, and the predetermination here is that there will never be any lorry on the uh, road, service lorry road, which means that um, ergo there can be no deliveries. The um, chair, um, the, it's not supposed to. The taxis are not supposed to come use the service service access. It's purely for the service vehicles. Taxis will have to look elsewhere to drop off and connect. So, so sorry about the chair. Is there a transport plan for uh, taxis? Uh, to get people to this hotel. Not everybody comes from the station. Not everybody can walk. Is there a transport plan for taxis for this location? Because Beulah Road and Graham Road have no parking at all for uh, taxis. Sure, it's a, it's a highly sustainable location, six to be. So there are the adequate transport links. There might be taxis and seem to be similar to the other hotels, nearby hotels. They had dropped the taxis and then, you know, collect and drop the customers. Mm -hmm. The bus lane, they can use it at off peak times. Questions. Um, the first one is about 611, where it says that the Metropolitan Police have raised some concerns. Um, in fact, the Metropolitan Police raised a whole number of concerns, and um, some of which I understand from talking to officers have been um, have been dealt with. Um, I wonder if we can be told: Are there any outstanding issues um, which the Metropolitan Police have raised, which aren't, which haven't been dealt with? Um, in particular, um, they have some concerns about the first floor reception area because they think the ground floor um, that's a, may, may lead to a kind of antisocial behaviour. So could you comment in, in general on um, all of the issues raised by the Metropolitan Police and in particular on the one about the first floor reception, please? And then I have some more questions. Uh, thank you. Yes, so the, um, looking at the Metropolitan Police's response, um, we have actually proposed an additional condition 37 um, that raises issues of security, CCTV, um, also including to the top of um, bomb blast resistance glazing. So we have included condition 37 on the modification sheet, right. which would catch that. In issues of the antisocial behaviour, in the hotel, um, the condition will actually include security measures for within the hotel itself as well. Um, so whilst the entrance is at ground floor level, uh, there is the mezzanine above, which does provide natural sources overlooking um, to the area. So uh, <coughs> weighing it up, um, we don't think that's going to be an issue of sticking in the scheme. Okay, thank you. Um, can we just move on to um, the whole business about traffic, and particularly the, the concerns um, that have been raised about local businesses um, 
on Beaver Road and about children going to school and uh, indeed uh, lots of other people walking along um, Graham Road. In section um, 32, um, one of the conditions is that activities should take place between 7 and 11, uh, 11 at night. Um, what um, powers does this committee have to um, alter that, to, risk, to reduce the hours, um, uh, both at, later on but particularly in the early morning? Um, and we've heard several people have referred to the, the service and delivery plan and encouraging turning left. Is there more that we can do than simply encouraging? Can we go further than that? And then I've got one more point after you've answered that. Um, in terms of the hours of, of servicing, um, so the hours are like that because it has a has an on-site service vehicle road, which um, is somewhat quite unusual for a um, town centre building like this. Um, so we have been um, reasonable on the hours of, of servicing. Um, in terms of the um, whether we can force people to turn left as the vehicles come out of the servicing road. Um, this is something I've discussed with our, our transport colleagues, and um, we can't force them to turn on that. Um, the delivery of service plan will be, will be showing that and encouraging that, um, but in terms of enforceability, we can't force them to turn that. Um, the proposal does include um, servicing uh, doors here, so vehicles coming out, they will always be in the forward gear. Um, which we think is better than, than reversing onto the blue road. Um, so, Sam, do you want to pick up on that? Um, there's adequate turning sweat part. We we'll check the sweat part analysis for vehicles ex coming, exiting onto Grand Road, and it's highly unlikely they will go onto the right and they will go left onto the, that's the shortest route to Hartfield Road. And there's adequate uh, turning area. And there is, uh, as it is, there's established crossover there. And there could have been vehicles crossing the site already. By addition, in a, there's highly unlikely there will be any other uh, trips compared to, we are thinking about three or four trips a day for the uh, service vehicles. So it's highly unlikely there be a uh, it'd be a modest increase. That's all. Crystal. Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, to, to be fair, the three to four chips isn't written in stone. That just happens to be the amount that at the moment they've said we don't really know. Can I, I just got one final comment. I wonder if we could just go back to the photographs of the street scene um, that you showed. Um, That one in particular. One of the concerns, I know I, that may just be the way that was taken, but one of the concerns I have is about the canyonization effect that I think one of the other speakers referred to. And you have another night, um, a nine story <laughs> building um, there, it's going to make it even darker. And I do have, I mean, I don't think there's a particularly attractive building to start with, but I'm worried that that height of building will make it even darker. Um, so thank you. Councillor uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, two questions. <clears throat> First of all, uh, on 7.5.4, <clears throat> regarding the, the delivery service plan, which also comes to the effect of the uh, uh, when it's prepared, what occupancy rate will it consider? Will it consider 50%, 75%, 100%? Uh, that's one question. Uh, and my second question is 7.5.3, uh, where it says hotels of this type Proposed are unlikely to attract guests arriving in large parties by coach. Uh, as such, very few coaches are expected to be generated by the proposed use of this site. Can you explain why this statement has been made? Because I would have thought, with, especially with the football stadium being built, you have lots of parties arriving by coach and staying at this hotel. <coughs>
which uh, yes, so the, um, the servicing plan we would be looking at um, is reviewed based on one percent capacity um, of the hotel. Um, in terms of coaches, um, I think really the officer. Um, yeah, I can't come on actually. actually. Um, so I think it's the fact that there is no there is no coach drop off. There is a label opposite, um, but it's not expected to have a lot of coaches coming to the centre. Castle, thank you very much. Um, uh, the exit from the service road onto Graham Road and the. Um, Encouragement for vehicles to turn left onto there. Um, I'm assuming that service road is entirely one way for all vehicles coming in from Buda Road and out onto Brown Road. And so if you're driving up Brown Road towards Parkfield Road, you cannot turn left into that service road because it's one way. So is it possible, and I'm not suggesting put it in a condition, but is it possible to put some sort of bollard in near that entrance which prevents a large vehicle turning right because the turning circle would be too, would be, they wouldn't have a small enough turning circle to be physically able to turn right which would force all vehicles to turn left because nobody would need to have that <coughs> turning circle to come up, going around and turn left into because it's one way. So if you just put a bollard or other piece of street furniture there you would be automatically forcing everyone to go left unless they were the fatal taxi that might go along the back where it's not supposed to, which has a very small turning so you can get around such a bar. Um, that, that's possible. It's, it's not an a, a enforcement by the highway, but the, the, the applicant can do a uh, signage exiting in and out, sign within their uh, land, not within the highway boundary. So what I'm hearing is because it's private land, the, the council has no jurisdiction. So this isn't going to be uh, one way coming two way, and you can't stop cars turning left or right into Graham, uh, nor uh, left as it will be into Beulah. That, that's what you're saying. You, you have no jurisdiction, therefore they can have it two way if they wish. Therefore they would reverse if they wish. If it's so right, it's it's the applicant <laughs> to enforce it. Yes. So, so but. Uh, so that means that it can be two way, they can turn right into the rain, and they can reverse, and there's nothing the council can do. That's the fact, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's, it's not two way. It's if the applicant make it one way, that's what I mean. So can you make them ensure it's one way? It's not designed to do it that way. Can you make them make it one way, legally? It's up, it's up to the applicant. Yeah, so that, that, that says to me you can't make them. Make it one way, will you? Yes, what happens? Put us all out of our misery here. Yeah. Okay, are there any other uh, comments, please? Counter making. Yeah, I've got, I've got uh, a couple of questions. Could you put your microphone on, please? Thanks. I've got a couple of questions. One is, how high is the uh, plant compound on top of the building? And, um, Apart from the build, which obviously would disrupt these in London, but what effect will the application have on the residents of Grand Rock when it's finished? And also, uh, I've got a third one as well, about the metal lake panels, as I mentioned, paragraph 7 to 10, and reflection. <coughs> uh, in terms of height of the building, um, I have set out the height of the building in the report. So the maximum height of the building um, to the top of the plant enclosure would be 28.4 metres on plan, with 25.9 metres, metres high to the top of the roof. So the plant, yeah, 2.5 metres or so in height. Um, in terms of the impact on residents of, of Graham Road, um, the site position is um, northeast of 
or Grim Road. If you look at the location plan for these workers, um, you'll see that they are angling away from the, um, from the site. Um, they have staggered the building in terms of its height as it goes back. Um, and you see the angle of the site this way as well. Um, so overall, we're, we're satisfied with the impact of the building itself on the community. And I can't remember your third point, sorry. Okay. So the set of panels would be flat on the roof itself. Um, so they are actually haven't shown it here, but it will be formed part of the, um, the discharge conditions process. Thank you. Um, um, I think I can bring a little bit of experience to this. this um, it was my weekend and evening job when I was in sick form working in a hotel. Um, it's also my full time job in my interest in the in hotels. Um, what I wanted to address actually is the four vehicles a day, roughly. Um, number of vehicles coming in and servicing at the back. Um, people said it may be more than that. Well, it may be a little bit more than that, but understanding the, the hotel business, basically there will be a linen truck once a day to pick up, to drop off the clean linen from the day before and, and pick up the, the dirty stuff from the night before, once a day for linen. There will be um, you know, drinks and dry stores for the uh, uh, presumed hotel um, bar and restaurant. And, once a week normally for drinks and dry stores. Fresher foods will be a much smaller vehicle, sometimes two or three times a week. I don't believe, however much you might want to scare like the residents that there are going to be 10 or more vehicle journeys every day. Four sounds to me like a very reasonable expectation of the number of visitors and vehicle visitors. Even if the three units there are all, for instance, cafe restaurants that have deliveries once a week of drinking, maybe slightly more often, but small amount of food stuff. Um, I, I do entirely believe, and with the acceptance from the applicant, that the service rate at the back will be entirely one way, one to the end, and that they'll put a ball out in the end to ensure that vehicles coming out turn left onto Grand Road. That, uh, those, all those things together um, deal with most of the um, Im impact on local residents, but the main impact on local residents, I believe, to residents of Grey Road and Grey Road, residents of Wider Merton, is 150 jobs and a large and high quality um, commercial development in the centre of Wimbledon, which is lacking in quality hotels. Um, and I think this is just, and it's not, it's just at the end of a residential street, but it's basically bang in the heart of Wimbledon Town Centre. If you can't put a hotel there, where on earth else in the borough could we put the hotel? This is a perfect position for it. It's a great addition to our borough. I cannot see, again, I cannot see a single good reason not to pass this application. Thank you. That was a comment rather than a question. Thank you. Another question. Council. 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 Council.
concede some physical management of um, traffic exiting the service road to take it up left on Brown Road. That is necessary because mm -hmm. it won't take people long to tweak that by turning right onto Brown Road uh, and exiting at the far end. They won't get down to Kingston Road and leave the area to the, the south. That is going to be an awful lot quicker than going around the entirety of all this one-way system. So I think we need uh, that to be physically engineered just in the way that the exit from the car park on Hartfield Crescent is likewise um, so engineered that, that, that you can only turn left into the one-way system. So that, 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 that's one concern. I'm largely reassured on the, uh, the, the surface and frequency. I, mean, I think um, 7 days a week, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. looks excessive, but if it's negligible anyway, perhaps that's um, not something we should worry about too much. But there, there is this real issue with, with the way that uh, we must enforce traffic uh, to turn that on very well. A little bit of history, really. Um, if what you've had so far isn't correct at all. This isn't the town centre. Um, it never was the town centre. Um, you'll find that on Morrison's car park was housing. Uh, there's never been any building on uh, Morrison's car park except for housing. Uh, this half of Crescent and half of Road and Beulah Road have always been housing. Uh, and you have a parade of small shops. Uh, the town centre starts across Beulah Road, and if you look historically, you find that's the case. Uh, this is residential, and I would be very disappointed if I lived uh, on a residential road and found somebody put uh, a nine-storey building next to me. A nine-storey building next to a house. That's exactly what's happening here. It's nine storeys, not eight storeys. And it's interesting that, that we hear about the access road as being um, that we can put some measures in. There are no measures that can be taken, none at all, and that's very clear. And if you live in this area, you will find that lorries uh, do find their way around um, because they know that that's not against the law. Uh, the safety of children is sacrosanct, not just emotionally, but legally. And these are residential roads, they're not distributed roads, they're not transport for London roads, they're not road routes, they are residential roads. And now you're going to get large lorries, it doesn't matter if it's one lorry, or four lorries, or a hundred lorries, it takes one lorry to run over a child. Yes. And one lorry, when it comes around the road because it's in a Hartfield lane, uh, the bus lane, has got to swing around widely, mm. and it will stay to the right, and it will have to swing around widely again. And if you think they don't turn right down Grain Road, well, I'm sorry. It's not the fact, because if they go to Marshall Road, there's traffic, and if they want to go south, they go down Grain Road, and they will clearly do that, and this council has said to my officers, have said they cannot do that. If you look at the requirement, I mean, when I sit in these meetings, if I've never been to Wimbledon, it sounds like a shanty town. <coughs> Falling to pieces, we've got uh, unemployment at 50% and the place is just a disaster. Well, Wimbledon isn't a disaster. Wimbledon has uh, plenty of growth in it. But this, at nine storeys, in an area which is residential, where clearly the transportation cannot be dealt with, it cannot be dealt with, 177 rooms on a tiny plot. For the first time I've ever seen in the 13 years I've sat on the first time ever, the police involved, and there was not a satisfactory reply from officers on the position of the police. That was a vague response, and it's quite clear the police are still unhappy about this. And I'll tell you what happened at the design review panels, because I was there. They were read, not once, but twice. This building looks the same as the building that was put in when it was thrown out. Thrown out by a design review panel that back the building of large buildings in our borough. And if that's the case, there's something deeply wrong with this. And we should be rejecting this. This is far too tall. It's not safe for locals. There's no doubt that transport cannot be dealt with. We need to reject it on bulk, 
massing and size which should be thrown out tonight. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to, to um, uh, make a proposal about um, uh, condition 32, the loading and uh, unloading hours, which currently are from 7 to um, 11 at night. And I'd like to propose that we change that um, to 10 in the morning to 10.30 at night. Those against? Oh, sorry, I just 
And those not voting. Thank you. So the recommendation is to, is to approve this, to vote it to approve the recommendation. Can we now look at the hours of operation? Between, is there a, 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 an amendment to adjust this from 10 till, what did from you say? 10 in the morning till, uh, so it's starting at 10 in the morning and finishing at half past 10. Those in favour, can I have a second for that please? Okay, those in favour, those against. Then that falls. The recommendation for the um, application is to grant planning permission subject to conditions in section 106 of the Thank you. application on section 73 of the original commission. The site was uh, commission was originally granted in 2017. Proposal 6 to vary condition 3, approved plans, and condition 20, opening hours, and remove condition 22, 23, 44 and 46, all related to the cafe and crash. The proposed changes are set out on pages 150 to 156 in the agenda. But in summary, the main changes are provision of additional 28 residential units, amended mix of units, remove, removal of crash and cafe from the stadium, removal of semi basement level in the stadium, amended design of the wall of the stadium, reduction of residential parking spaces and stadium parking spaces, provision of 19 retail parking spaces, and then fill a new residential block to block A and additional pool. Uh, members talking you through. The plans. It is clearly a large site. Um, the plans are capture the whole site. Um, in terms of the infill residential block that is proposed over this part of the site, this is the proposed basement plan. Um, I do have a parking plan in colour later on in the presentation. Um, looking at first floor level, um, so where the symbol D here is, is where the infill block is supposed to be. Other changes to the stadium, uh, mainly this corner here, which I do have a 3D sketch to show you. Um, I'm not including every single floor plan in the scene, um, just a few, so this is jumping to the fourth floor level. Um, in the infill block here. And the seventh floor level, as well. Turning to the car parking, in the purple, light purple, is uh, residential on the building A. This is all known as building A. The proposal includes the provision of orange here, which is retail car parking, which is served the existing agreed retail unit, which is here. The squash club parking, which was in this position, has now been moved over here and also a reduction in some residential parking within the scheme as well. Uh, turning to elevations, it's been difficult to capture the um, elevations for you, but the infill block, which is here, simple D, 
is here and here. Get the saline on the left. Um, again, just some section drawings showing the saline and block C. Uh, so this is the view of the elevation of the post internally to the north-south street, running to the east of the uh, stadium. Um, again, there's the input block here. So this runs that way, and then it continues on the way along. This is looking at block B. It's another section of the stadium scheme. Uh, the walls of the same scheme um, have slightly changed and some of the uh, green walls would now be at first level above or more down at ground floor level. This is the elevations of the saving scheme itself. Um, we do have a, a sketch as to how this corner would, would indicate to look um, as part of the scheme. The original proposal had a curved edge to the edge of the stadium. Um, so this will be the main entrance which will be visible from the main public road to the south. Um, so I hope that just assists um, with that with visual aid. Turning to site pictures, the site is obviously a construction site at the moment. Um, the Volante site refers in the report. This is buildings here. Looking across the site, uh, from the south, so you've got a little and other retail units opposite to the south. Onto Summers Town Road, uh, this is looking north. Um, this is the Volante site that's next, next to us here. This is a bit further up, um, so on the left, behind the blue uh, holding, is the site. Looking back the other way, just showing some of the characters around the area. And again, the pub on the north corner, as you see it, and this road runs to the north, which serves a number of industrial and non industrial units to the north. Uh, members, I turn attention to the modifications sheet. You'll see that we had a, um, some late letters of objection received, um, and there's also some updates to the committee report. Um, you'll see that we have summarised in detail and provided responses in detail to those. Further, we have proposed some updates and amendments to the report, particular paragraphs, um, to clarify retail car parking, for example, at paragraph 8, 10, 7. Um, it's revision of 21, 21 car parking bays. Also, at paragraphs 8.1.3, um, in terms of the key plan considerations, bullet points added is air quality and affordable housing within that list. In terms of the scheme itself, as our committee report, there's no definition of what may constitute a minor material amendment. Taking into context the original planning commission, officers satisfied to propose changes fall within this category. Having regard to the context of the original commission and taking consideration of proposed changes, it is considered that these changes can be accepted and supported by the council. The visual changes will be relatively minor when compared to the original commission. The internal alterations, loss of Gresham Cafe, and the original retail car park can be accommodated. Additional benefits to arise from this proposal with the provision of additional residential units, including additional affordable housing and mitigation measures for air quality. Overall, the proposal still represents a sustainable development in line with the adopted site allocations policy. Officers therefore recommend permission be granted subject to conditions and deed of variation to the Section 106 agreement. Thank you, Chair. There's quite a lot of information on the modifications, which I think you should have an opportunity to look through. So I'm going to set aside um, five minutes for us to do that.
Um, I hope you're okay. If not, I'm going to ask the objectors. We've got two objectors and also our councillor uh, Gretchen here wishing to speak. Um, so, can I call on Sarah Sharp, please? One minute, Mr. Minute, one minute, one minute. One minute. Um, Chair. Chair, 
This high-profile application, which is the officer's words, not mine, has submitted a critical paper relating to the scrapping of the crash. Since September, I've been trying to find a document I saw as part of this planning application on the portal, which gave the applicant justification to remove it, the only community provision in this application. The, applica the applicant said, quote, having market and operational factors around the delivery of this use, it has been confirmed that there is no identified need and it's neither economically or practically realistic. The council has confirmed that there is no identified need for additional nursery spaces to serve this area, unquote. So how can Madam Council's Child Care Sufficiency Report of 2018 state otherwise? Why is this report not included in the application and who in the council confirmed there was no identified need for additional nursery spaces to serve this area? Merton's own child care sufficiency report states that, quote, whilst the estimated population of very young children across Merton is decreasing, there are three wards, Lavender Fields, Figs Marsh and Wimbledon Park that have the highest numbers of children under the age of five and also have planned or potential local development housing schemes of over 100 units or more. This may impact on demand for additional childcare provision in these local communities in the future. These are a few words of wards, Wimbledon Park and St. Helia in particular, where available places do not meet, meet demand. Chair, we have a huge development before us tonight, 632 new housing units with questionable affording housing levels, and we have to ask the question, why are these material facts not included in the officer's report? Why are you, as PAC members, not being made aware of the childcare shortages in Wimbledon Park? Who in Merton is advising otherwise? Two FOIs, one that turned up with three emails and an internal review, and the second one that turned out 2,000 emails. Um, and still that council document that was on the portal attached to childcare needs is not there. Where's the evidence by the applicant that the council did indeed advise that it was fine to remove the crash? And why is the council not asking the applicant to find another site for the crash within this huge development? In its own healthcare impact assessment of September 2015.510, it says the applicant is considering options for nursery crash provision on site and will seek to provide this where most suitable. So my question is why isn't the council asking for the applicant to fund provision for much needed childcare in Wimbledon Park as was promised under this application? If not on the development, then perhaps elsewhere. Sorry, Finally, where sorry, is the... Sorry. Thank you. Air pollution in London kills 33 people every day. And I, as I understand it, it kills about eight people, one in eight people in Merton. But the committee before me, statistically speaking, that's one person. And in this room, in the last uh, issue, it was eight people. Because of this, London Merton National and Merton Planning Guidelines require that any developments must be refused if it increases air pollution in an area that exceeds the EU limit. Even though this is a minor amendment, it requires an environment state statement as if it were a new application. This must show that it leads to no increase in air pollution. The applicants have submitted an environmental statement and they have modelled the NO2 levels in the future and in the past. The problem is that the NO2 levels in the past simply disagree substantially with those measured by Merton Council. The applicants have tried to explain this away by thinking of the distance that Merton, between theirs and Merton's results. But this analysis also disagrees with that of Merton Council. Using DEFRA guidelines, we can calculate the errors in the modeling, and these are extremely large. We have taken professional advice from a professor of statistics whose speciality is in air quality, and he agrees with us. On behalf of the Wimbledon Park residents, Clyde and Co. have written to Merton Council requesting a good explanation of all these discrepancies. And this we have not seen. 
To summarise, the environmental assessment with this application disagrees with the past results and it has large uncertainties. And as far as I'm aware, Melbourne Council has not resolved these discrepancies. As such, this application uh, has a flawed environmental statement but does not stand up to scrutiny and it really should be refused. At the very least, it should be withdrawn until these matters are resolved. Thank you. Um, call on Philip Thornton, please. Um, yes, good evening. Um, just to pick up on the two points raised there and objections. Um, the first one in relation to the removal of the crash from the stadium. Um, there is a site proposal, um, adopted site proposal 37, that states what uses must be provided as part of this development. Um, and the, that, that use is auto intensification with enabling development. Um, there is no reference to a crash in Site Proposal 37. But to be enabling development, it's got to be commercially sustainable. And we have been out, we've talked to uh, potential operators for the crash, um, who have uh, indicated strongly this is, not, that this is not commercially sustainable. There are severe limitations to do with the location of a crash, not an earthquake, a crash within an operational football stadium that can provide no dedicated outdoor play space which is a, a requirement, and it also has very limited um, access and drop-off uh, facilities for parents. So on that basis, we've concluded that the crash is not commercially sustainable, and it removed it from the um, proposal. There are still um, aspects of the scheme which are there for the community and to enjoy. There's a squash and fitness club. There will be community uses taking part um, as part of the stadium. Um, it's just that on that basis, we have removed it. Um, Taking uh, now to in terms of the uh, issue of air quality, um, as you appreciate that uh, the application has been supported by a full um, assessment of air quality in the environmental statement addendum, we have used um, our well-respected and specialist qualified um, advisors on that um, who have made a rigorous assessment of the latest air quality uh, uh, parameters and concluded that there are no issues. This is in, it's supported by common sense as well, in that as part of the, the proposal, we're reducing both stadium and residential car parking. Um, so that, you know, that, that um, in itself uh, is, is a sort of measure of the direction this is going. Um, so we have reassured ourselves, we've scrutinised our own assessment of air quality, and we remain entirely confident that it will stand up, both in terms of its methodology and its conclusions. Um, the other, in terms of the benefits of the scheme, we are now able to provide 28 uh, additional um, homes for people, and of those 28, uh, 20, that's 70%, of the additional homes are affordable um, and will be delivered by Catalyst Housing Association, who are our partner in this scheme. So I, um, that's, that's um, I think that's all I have to say in relation to the residential side. I don't know if um, Mr. Samson would like to say anything in relation to the, the stadium football camp aspect. Um, well, the short answer is no, nothing came up in the um, challenges that related directly to the football stadium other than the crash was Mr. Dublin is left with some Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Chair, if I could just refer to the, the very good bit of process which went on with the removal of the basement in the uh, amended application. Uh, the Residents Association of Wimbledon Park asked that that be properly put to the Environment Agency who assessed it properly and confirmed that removal of the flood mitigation measure was indeed accepted. That's an example of good process, but I think what we've just heard is that on the China, it, it didn't make a great deal of sense, Chair, when the council was saying on the one hand, or the planning statement said that the council had said there was no need for any additional childcare capacity, but of course we have a very formal report of this council in the, in the childcare sufficiency report that says Wimbledon Park um, does not have a sufficient number of childcare places. So when you have a very clear, um, diametrically opposed anomaly like that, really the best thing to do would be adjourn um, the application 
so that these uh, these major discrepancies could be set on properly addressed. And of course, the other issue we've heard on air quality as well. And this is a recurrent theme, Chair. Where the legal requirement is for for developments to be less than 40 milligram um, per cubic meter for NO2. And uh, what, what we saw here was the, the baseline data being very, very significantly less than uh, the data which, of course, are set out in the air quality annual statement for the council itself, which showed levels very much in excess of, of the legal threshold of 40 milligrams per cubic meter. Um, the application had levels of about modeled hypothetical levels in, in the 30s and low 30s, whereas the council's own data, indeed of the very uh, qualified residents who put up the diffusion sheet supplied by the council, in fact show a range of between about 45 up to 70. So where you have such a clear discrepancy on the, on the NO2 levels, it's entirely appropriate that perhaps um, the application be adjourned so that uh, we can have the right mitigation, the right understanding um, of actually what the NO2 impacts um, should be. And that's why we're suggesting, I think, um, Chair, there should be an adjournment. Um, and I should say, Chair, that if for any reason there is not um, an adjournment, and if uh, there is a majority vote um, in favour of the application, may I suggest as a condition, Chair, that having seen the, uh, the very angular feature um, which are the removal of the much softer radial curves, which would have given so much more back to the community that the, the panel consider uh, reinstating the, the previous um, design with, uh, by way of condition. I think we've got about £10 million pounds of extra revenue coming through the 30 new infill apartment blocks, um, the 30 new uh, units in, in the new infill block, of course, that will raise a lot of extra revenue. So it may be a very positive uh, condition to, by way of design to require that a softer, more pleasant radial curve uh, be reinstated in lieu of the very angular feature which we've just seen up on the screen. So that would be a, a very beneficial, positive um, condition that could be considered um, using the extra revenue from the extra um, 30 or so units. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Um, could you just clarify um, the position on affordable housing? I, I'm sure I read somewhere that the, the new proposals have a much bigger increase in affordable housing, which I think was at a very low level originally. And I'm, I'm just not clear. So could you just tell us what the number before and after was and, 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 and a rough percentage as well, please? Yes, yeah, so the scheme, original scheme proposed 60 affordable housing. Right. 60 units. The current scheme um, proposes an increase of 20 um, to be secured within the session warranties agreement. Um, there is what is also proposed um, is an additional uh, 100 uh, shared ownership units by the provider um, department with um, Gallup and Cathy's homes um, are proposing to, to deliver those. Um, due to the viability of the scheme, they, they can't be tied with the Session 1 6 agreements um, for viability reasons, but that is their intention and that is why the approval having um, shows that. Good, so can you, uh, thank you, that's very helpful, but can we just clarify, so the 100 shared, shared ownership are not included in the <coughs> affordable housing because they're not affordable housing? Um. There will be affordable housing, but we, they're, they're not to be secured within the Section 106 agreement. So the intention is that there will be shared ownership units. So um, they will count towards the affordable housing target of the budget? Uh, yes, if they're delivered as that. Okay, thank you. The main planning game um, for this development was well, thank you. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, please? Councillor Southgate. I'd like to follow up on the uh, 101 uh, shared ownership units. Um, I think the question here is whether we, Merton, have nomination rights to those, or are they effectively offered on the open market? Yeah, if, if, they're, if they're not secured within the session of agreement, then we, um, we can't um, secure the nomination rights um, under that. So it's, um, 
it, it is a benefit that the scheme will see the benefit of putting that forward. Um, it's just that we can't tie it down um, due to the biodiversity reasons. Are there any other questions? Move on to comments then. Councillor I know um, a lot of time is spent on uh, giving great weight to this crash uh, in the initial planning application. And uh, I'm not a cynic, of course, as you know, um, and um, I'm just surprised by this amazing uh, about uh, that suddenly the applicant has decided that uh, this isn't required. Uh, but that's up to developers to uh, spin their yarns. But what um, is disappointing is that the council hasn't looked at its own documentation. And uh, if there is a statutory need in this area, then really what the council needs to do is uh, ask for monies from the developer to replace what they promised in return for a planning application. Because as much as the stadium was an important part, so was the crash. A legally binding presentation was made and accepted by this planning applications committee for a crash. And this council has a requirement there is a shortage in this ward, and uh, the council should be asking for uh, the monies um, to mitigate the promise, the legal promise, that a crash would be on this site. And uh, I have a very good feeling that this is going to be passed, but I think it shouldn't be. This council should stand up for itself. Are there any other comments? Councillor Sunkey. Quite a different aspect, and this <laughs> relates to design and our own um, design officer's comments on page 186. Um, she describes some sort of a backward step in terms of design. I'm particularly concerned and echoing Councillor Breton's point with the proposal to, to square the corners rather than retaining the original rounded design. Um, I, mean, I know it's, you know, we can't afford to start a hadith here, but um, if you think of stadiums um, such as Wembley, such as the, 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 you know, the Olympic Stadium, so if you want it to look like a stadium, it, it should be of an oval shape. There would also be a suitable um, like reminder of the, the wonderful dog stadium that preceded it. Um, and having sat on this committee for a lot of years, we've let enough things go that I now pass by and think, oh, we should have, we should have held out there. And this, frankly, it's, it would be a great shame to compromise the design for what I feel is it's probably thousands of pounds, I know, but it's just going to be one of those things that you'll look at it afterwards and say, what a shame we, we did that. We haven't got any good <coughs> images here, but I've just got a feeling that looking at the plans, squaring it off like that, and we'll realise it was a mistake.
this number of pressure facilities, and that specific number uh, should be clawed back from the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Um, so you'll see on the update in the publication sheet that um, we can see the quite extensive view from our planning policy officer on this on this issue. Um, the crash was added um, late in the scheme um, to add um, visual uh, visual uh, character to that to that North South Street. Um, there is no current policy requirement for that crash to be within this um, within the proposals. Um, that is why we are happy with it to, to not be in the proposals. Um, in terms of clawback, we will note page page two three five onwards to. Two four two four one. We set out um, all the section one six monies, which is being provided um, with this development. Um, also, additional twenty eight units um, within the scheme um, would generate a little bit more um, community infrastructure levy money for the, um, for the council. So um, our advice is um, that you can't. To, to not add that all that money for the loss of the crash um, as it's in it was an additional S96 here this is the S96 money and you say it came in late that crash it doesn't matter this council committee saw the crash at the presentation now I accept it wouldn't have made any difference to the outcome but the point is it was there for a reason was it there for childcare or was it there to pass this application and I believe the latter and I think you should get a clock back. If you're saying to me, it can't be done, it won't be done, that's fine. But I think we should at least vote on it. Are all voices against that? But all mm -hmm. Up to you, Chair. What you do. do we actually have the legal... Uh, I'm not entirely clear that I still understand what it is we're being asked to agree. Do we actually have the legal power to ask for this money, or are we saying the money we would get will be used for this rather than something else? Do we have any further comments, please? Councillor Sutherland. I think your question under this point about design, I think the only way I'm going to be able to take that forward is, is I'm afraid to uh, propose refusal on, on grounds of compromise design. I, I do so in the full knowledge that this is a major scheme. I think it's something that could be addressed quite quickly and easily by the applicant, but I don't know. And as I say, it's, it's one of the, you know, this is stadia or important to the, 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 the feeling of a town, the sense of community, and we, we just want to spend the, the feeble necessary to get this right. So I, I will propose, I think I have proposed reviews on grounds of essentially compromised design. If I can do that. Okay. Are there any other comments, please? In which case, I'm going to move. Can we agree the recommendation? So, is it favour, please, sir? Those against? Not voting. <coughs> then the recommendation to approve is carried. Um, I'd like to suggest the outcome of the please. Thirteen, which is 52 to 54 Wandle Bank. Good chair. Um, members, the application site is located on the east of East Road and to, uh, and to the west of the residential properties which front of Wandle Bank. The site currently comprises a mixture of light industrial units with two access points off East Road and Wandle Bank. 
The sites around these comprise residential properties to the north, east, and west, along the bus depots in the south, and primary schools to the southwest. The proposal itself is a very condition application to the existing plan commission to provide an extra 11 residential units on this, within the scheme. The proposal will result in an increase from 34 flats to 45. The proposal relates to Block A only within the scheme, which is this block here at the bottom. The external materials would be those as already granted previously, with the main change being the use of the roof void as habitable space to create additional units. Cycle storage and bin storage facilities are proposed to be upgraded to accommodate the extra units. The proposed increase in units, the proposal also includes four on site affordable housing units, which includes three social rent and one shared ownership, as opposed to the off site financial contribution secured under the previous application. So members talking you through some of the broad plans of the proposal. The original scheme um, was a full redevelopment of the site which included provision of some units at the back here and here for residential. At ground floor level was proposed some uh, commercial units on this side of the building. That's remained uh, unchanged. The main changes are within the building itself. Um, we've through some internal alterations to create the extra 11 new units. Um, each flat will have access to uh, an outdoor space. Um, a number of the units would be called um, duplex units set over two floors. So, for example, here you can see it's a three bed flat, three bedrooms here at first floor which have stairs down to their ground floor living space at ground floor level. Um, those particular units benefit from a, um, a small garden out, out to the rear. Uh, so second floor plan, third floor plan, um, again, some split level units proposed. Um, use of the uh, outdoor terrace at the rear on the side here. Um, that was um, previously agreed as well under the previous consensus scheme. The previous consensus scheme had um, what I would call a, a sort of floating roof structure, um, which included, it didn't include habitable space, but it included um, some outdoor uh, amenity space for the flats below um, within the sort of roof board. So the main change with this proposal is that it doesn't propose that now, but it includes that space to be habitable accommodation. Turning to the elevations, the general design approach of the building remains the same. The whole uh, the scale, bulk and mass of the building and height remains the same. Uh, that roof form stays the same here, so with the exception of putting in a um, mixture of glazing and some balconies um, to accommodate the habitable floor space. <coughs> On the other side of the building, again just showing that there. Um, so next to the sides, it really just shows the context as well, some of the previously agreed buildings over here. Um, this is a, a, a sort of section drawing showing um, where proposed balconies are proposed at top floor level. Um, the actual standing space is set back from um, installed planters and we have <coughs> um, a, a privacy screen which will be obscured, obscured in days. Um, this is the plan so that just to just demonstrate that the, the, uh, the buildings at the back here are not to change. We've also provided some 3D visual aids to assist with the with the assessment. So, um, whereas before up here it was to be balustraded but open, so outdoor space <coughs> under the roof, um, what is proposed now is to build this area here um, with a mixture of glazing and some external terraces as well. And again, from here. So on this particular side of the building, originally agreed was the fans here, which are angled at a certain, a certain way, providing views away from uh, neighbouring gardens here to these terraces. 
Um, they are obviously Glaze, the fans, and they are to retain as part of this application, so they're not changing as previously agreed. Um, there are some external changes up here in terms of windows and the, and, um, the position of this little, the, the unit here. Turning to site for photographs, um, this on East Road, looking at the site on the right. Again here, looking into the site. And again here. And we're just standing back. But on the left here is the um, is school. Um, there are the rear renovations of the properties uh, on the local site to the right here. Again there. And there. Um, overall, Chair, the proposal will provide additional lending units to the consensus scheme. Officers satisfied the overall design, remains of high quality, as well as the standard accommodation. The proposal now includes four of the units to be for affordable housing, including three social rented units. Officers have not identified plan of harm within the additional units on the already consensus scheme, and therefore recommend permission be granted such conditions and the legal variations of section 106 agreement. Thank you. Um, Catherine Herbert, please. The original plan for 34 residential units and office space was already far too dense for the size of this site and the surrounding environment and amenities. Although the applicant describes this as minor material amendments, the increase to 45 residential units represents an additional 30% more units which is a very substantial increase and overdevelopment of a relatively small site. The change from roof terraces to units represents an additional story to Block A. This building already dwarfs the surrounding residential dwellings, and even on the developer's own drawings, the overlooking onto neighbouring properties is extended, leading to even greater loss of privacy and light infringement. The increase in cycle space is an assumption that the new residents will form car clubs which will cut traffic and parking problems is utopian, and the developers' data that there is plenty of available parking space does not equate with our everyday experience. In the original application, the council accepted £200,000 in lieu of affordable housing, representing four units. In this application, the developers will provide three units of social and one of affordable housing. This is still four units, despite there being an additional 11 units. So surely there should be at least one more social or affordable unit. My main concern is that the already high risk of flooding or possible subsidence in our properties will be exacerbated with its own development on a flood plain. The papers refer back to the flood risk assessment from the original application, but even in the most recent version of this, the vital measurements which would demonstrate the level of risk were still missing. Will the Council and Environment Agency really allow this to proceed without having all the relevant information to protect both the existing residents and the potential new homeowners? Or if these figures are now available, can they please be made public? In neither the application papers nor the Planning Department's assessment, is any practical or design imperative given for the additional units. So there appears to be no reason for the amendment other than pure profit. I would ask the Planning Committee to please consider the right that this amended application will add to the lives of the local residents and for once look to preserving our right to enjoy our homes without fear of flood, structural damage, loss of privacy and light deprivation over the greater developers and reject this application. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Simon Howard, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's actually Scott Hudson on behalf of the applicant on the agent. Uh, just like to know we fully support the officer's recommendation and a few issues and items to reiterate. First of all, the principle of redevelopment of this site has previously been agreed under the previous permission. The proposals are an amendment to a previously approved application to allow for the 11 additional residential units within the existing building envelope. Density proposed is still in accordance with the London plan requirements. An updated parking survey was carried out by our transport consultants 
which confirmed that there was adequate parking capacity within 400 metres of the site. Updated surveys were carried out overnight and during the day. This has been signed off by the Council's highways department, as noted in paragraph 7.9.10. Future residents would not be entitled to parking permits. Private parking spaces to be provided on site will be made available to the family units only. The proposed amendments will have no further impact on the sunlight and daylight results of the previous permission agreed, as it's within the same building envelope. There's no additional impact on overlooking to adjacent properties. Again, this is referenced in paragraph 7.5.3 of the officer's report. This remains as approved. The amendments will now provide for four affordable units on the site where it was previously an agreed payment in lieu. I mean, it should be noted that that payment in lieu previously would, would not be sufficient enough to provide one unit on site. We are now providing four affordable units on site. So, in summary, we believe there are a number of planning benefits, provision of additional housing units for the borough, provision of affordable housing now on site where previously it was paying in lieu, high quality design of the approved scheme has been retained, high quality residential accommodation continued with the proposed amenity space and place space provided, over 40% family accommodation, continued provision of employment floor space, and cycle parking spaces in accordance with the London plan. I therefore re respectfully request that the members approve this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, please. Councillor Megan. Uh, I'm interested in the affordable housing element. Um, put, as I understand it, they put 11 properties, 11 new places on it. They've offered four housing, four affordable housing properties, of which they're basically the ones that were offered the first time as went forward. And as the speaker said, we've then, then actually got 11 new properties with no affordable housing in there. Um, I wasn't on the panel when it was first heard, so I obviously can't change it, but um, can you tell me why we haven't gone for 30%? as we often do. Thank you, Chair. Um, the original application proposed um, only a financial contribution off-site. Um, it didn't provide any affordable housing on-site, um, which was £200,000. The, the current scheme, which has been subject to those who review reviewed by our assessor, um, shows that they can deliver four on-site units, um, as opposed to the financial contribution. So it does propose 11 additional units, but the, the, there is the benefit of providing four of those will be on site um, affordable housing as opposed to the original scheme, which was um, just contribution. Check on that. Four is uh, about 36% of 11, that's true, but it's not the, the remainder. And if it's one family altogether, it's affordable housing about 10%, which is. Um, not really what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for at least 30, 25 minimum. Any other questions? Councillor Sarkin. Chair, thank you. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but we are told that very small allocations of affordable housing are not necessarily attractive to um, have associations to manage. Can you comment on that? Um, well, the proposal does include on site. Um, there has been no discussions of um, uh, a contribution um, replacing that. Um, so that is that's what's proposed. Um, three specifically for social rent. Um, so, what well, if, if it was to be granted tonight? Then that would be the affordable housing contribution um, to be sought on the site and not by a contribution. <coughs> Again. Yes, if you can do a bit better. Um, in the past, we, we have been encouraged to accept um, contributions to Lou on the grounds that managing just two, three, four units within a development is not very really attractive to, to a housing association. 
that they can look to manage a, a larger minimum number of units. Um, I think, to comfort chair, the, you know, the, the scheme is um, it just provide for on site. Um, that, is, that is the offer. Um, and that's what will be secured in the session of six agreement. Um, it, it, it is a, uh, a different area to some of some similar schemes, uh, perhaps in uh, you know, Wimbledon, but land values are a lot, a lot, a lot different. Um, so that is the offer this evening. It's four on the site, and that's all we're going to secure. I don't know if it'll be yeah, Sorry. Okay. Uh, I wonder if we just tease out from Councillor Southgate. Is Councillor Southgate mm, suggesting perhaps that if a larger number of units could be delivered, but that didn't necessarily square with the Council's preferred term <coughs> mix? but was able to secure interest from a registered provider. Are you suggesting that officers review how that affordable housing offer is configured? Because clearly from a developer's point of view, the social rented element of the scheme would um, be less attractive from a viability perspective than perhaps the shared ownership aspect um, of, of the scheme, but our policy is very much that we should seek 60% rented and 40% shared ownership, but we've got that conundrum there, but if the scheme delivered, or if, if something around the maths again, the figures actually turned out you could get more units if there were shared ownership, but that didn't square with the council's policy. I, I just wonder, you know, in which direction might Councillor Southgate be encouraging officers to explore? Um, yeah. Yeah, Councillor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Mr. Lewis, it'd be far more um, you know, uh, sightedness than I uh, would prefer that they remained as units for social rent. But that, that, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, I also, while I'm here, actually say that I'm very encouraged by the fact that the configuration, the number of the, the, the number of bedrooms per unit is a welcome change with three and four bed units um, to the number of studio and one bed units, and it does help just a little to redress the, the balance towards the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, provision that we would prefer to see. So. No, I don't, I don't want to change the, uh, the, the mix of uh, the table. That's important. Um, my understanding, and officers will um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was a previous application where um, the applicants came to us saying we'd like to, um, <coughs> it was on one of the board, I believe, um, they said they would like to provide social housing, but it, that they, as Councillor Sasek said, they may have a problem getting a um, has provided to provide a small number of units in one block, and therefore, as a sort of backstop, they were saying, if we can't find a good provider, we'll give you lots of money instead. I'm assuming that as this developer is not suggesting that, then they may be, then they must be very confident that they will be able to secure a housing provider to come in and provide the three um, social housing. Um, social rented units, um, because they haven't said, if we can't, we'll give you some money instead, which is the previous application that I think that's what we're going to. Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Almost anyone over there. Councillor Dick. Thank you, Chair. Has the applicant provided a financial viability assessment or analysis? And you've checked it and, and your conclusions are in line with them? Yes, I've been submitted and um, reviewed by our, um, by our assessor, external assessor, um, in Henry. So, uh, yeah, that's all the subject. Councillor Question What is the um, affordable housing, the level of affordable housing which council officers proposed and all councillors voted for uh, at this council currently? Uh, current policy. The stock, uh, current cost position is 40% um, on site. Yes. 
on the core strategy course. So, so the reason I didn't use the word current policy is I just wanted to be clear that it was officers and uh, councillors that um, proposed that and accepted that. But why hasn't the uh, council spoken to this um, applicant about the current policy? I didn't know you were around, sorry. But I'm getting answered in here. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, can you please just refer to the So, the starting point is always to develop plan policy, 40%. Um, if they can't um, achieve that, then um, um, if they, to justify that, it has to be through viability uh, reports, and that is independently assessed by our um, assessor. Um, and so, in that process, we try to see as much of the housing as possible. Um, but um, government guidance is that we cannot um, refuse permission um, if, um, if the scheme is um, so to see, uh, unviable with the level of affordable housing proposed in the, um, in the local plan for the scheme. So it, it, they have gone through the right channels with, with the application in terms of us getting it assessed um, by my biology assessor, and that's what is, is come out as um, for this site. Do we have a callback mechanism on this? Uh, yes, that is, that is included um, with, with the application. Um, it is set out on the page one within the variations of the leaf green um, under the original permission. Yeah, that's good news, that it's not a crash where we can't fall back, but it is a property where we can, so that's good news. Can I just ask one more question? <coughs> 2317 on Crossrail, is this the overrunning over budget Crossrail or the abandoned Crossrail that this money is going to? My understanding is that is for the future crossrail project that comes through the harbour. So, um, on the basis that might be abandoned, and I'm sorry to say, I might be slightly cynical, what happens to the cash? Concerns about this regarding the delivery of the corporate housing. If we go back to policy 3.12 of the, uh, the London plan, the, 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 the approach there is the maximum reasonable amount of corporate housing should be sought and negotiated on individual um, sites. Having regard to, I mean, it lists a number of criteria. And criteria point G is resources available to fund affordable housing to maximise affordable housing output. Um, all I would, all I would. Um, add is that the council did uh, collect money from a number of smaller um, schemes to deliver uh, affordable housing. Um, and perhaps rather than completely sort of cut across um, my colleagues' um, report on this, which would be you know, quite wrong, if, if members felt that it was worth admitting um, that um, the uh, issue of looking at the funds available which the council holds and whether or not that's something which officers should at least take back to our colleagues in housing to see whether or not delivering extra units on this site would be good value for money because at the end of the day the council can only use that money to demonstrate that it's, it's good value for delivering the extra units um, then at least that would give 
an indication to um, officers that perhaps further discussions um, could be uh, could be had on uh, uh, on that particular matter. But it would just be something that could be perhaps omitted. Any other comments? I'm going to vote. Oh, no. Yeah, no. Okay. Can I, those in, in favour of the recommendations, please? Please show. Those against? Um, the recommendation uh, says variation of conditions, subject to conditions, and these are variation of, to the 106 agreement is the recommendation which is being approved. Continued use for a specific time period 
whilst construction is carried out on the new indoor port facility opposite. The proposed dome is considered to be visually acceptable for this time period, and although artificial in nature, it is considered harmful. Appropriate noise mitigation is proposed, and the Council of Environmental Health Officers have raised no objection following receipt of that mitigation. Officer Zeb Redman, who should be granted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Any comments? No. We move to the recommendation then. Can we agree to the recommendation? Yes, okay. Thank you. That's, uh, that's agreed. The recommendation is Wow. That was quick. <laughs> Should put that one on first. <laughs> We now move on to agenda item eight, which is three five six car road. Objection, 
that it would be now unreasonable to withhold permission and the permission should therefore be granted subject to conditions. Thank you. So we had quite a debate on this last time when it came in November, which is not that long ago. Um, so I think it's um, for us to decide whether or not we feel it's gone far enough. Are there any questions? Councillor Southgate. Um, no, not Okay. Just take a look said that it's not unreasonable to pass this, but um, uh, there's no change in that because the officer said the same thing last time, didn't he? Say that again, I didn't hear right now. The officer has yes. just said that they believe it's not unreasonable to pass this. But according to the documents, that was exactly the same position as last time. So there is no difference in their opinion, even though there is a change. So that's what I'm, I'm confirming. I'm asking this question. Did you say last time to pass it? And I've said last time to pass it. It's the same position. Yeah. Any, any more? Yes. Yeah. Councillor Kelly. Yeah. Is it a question or is it? Comment, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, Councillor Lee Rose previously recommended to us for approval, and we we disagreed with that. Um, I guess this is the system working as it should. So the applicant has considered the, the reason for reviews and come back with a a change of design. Um, we just have to make a judgment whether an extra one and a half meters in length of the sort of subterranean patio area is sufficient to overcome our concerns. I find that very hard to to weigh up. You know, how would I feel? I, I, I suspect on balance we, we, we should accept that, actually. Um, but I, I can't quite imagine how that would work as a, a livable space. It's, Is that going to provide a, an adequate amenity area? <laughs> then what other members feel? <laughs> is it a question? Make it a question. Yeah. Councillor Kelly. Yeah. Um, Chair, um, I think the, the, the approach that officers will read it well, but, uh, but I'll take with um, officers, um, is literally to, to, to get a tape measure out uh, in, in the office and find an area of the office that's enclosed to have by cabinets and cupboards where you've got a sort of a defining point with a window, uh, measure the height from the floor to the, the ceiling and really just try and visualise, you know, for real, um, what what that would feel like. Um, and uh, you, you, you can see that, that I think that, that one and a half uh, metres um, extra, um, you know, I, I, I genuinely feel um, will make um, uh, uh, a material difference. You know, I acknowledge that our recommendation is the same as last time, but previously we felt that the proposals um, were um, satisfactory. Um, but in this instance, you know, I, I would um, really say I think it would be um, it would be quite harsh. I think now with with um, uh, uh, Patio area um, extending to um, uh, perhaps 14 feet uh, from uh, the uh, uh, basement level um, uh, living room, um, but um, somehow uh, that wouldn't uh, provide um, a reasonable um, outlook um, for uh, future um, occupiers. Um, I don't see it as an outlook, I think it's a different scenario, but um, what percentage of this house is, is underground. Looking at the drawings um, before me, I would suggest that something in the order of two-fifths of the accommodation um, is at ground level and that probably three-fifths would be at, at, uh, at lower ground level. So in terms of your basement strategy policy, I don't know if it's a legal policy, but I think it's an SPG as far as I understand. You, you talk
talk about uh, basements being less than 50% of the proportion of the house. Is that the case? I think our policy is look at actually um, uh, creating um, extensions underneath gardens um, of um, uh, existing um, houses. And in, in this instance, what we're doing is we're actually um, excavating uh, an area um, at the rear uh, of the property. Really, I suppose, in a sense, working with changes in levels because uh, if you visited this, the, the site, uh, you'll appreciate that the turning head at the far end of Wide or Close um, is lower than the junction of Wide or Close um, and Garth uh, Road. So, in a sense, uh, the applicant um, and um, his or her designer is working with uh, the lie of the land um, in, in, in this particular um, instance um, quite creatively. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, I remember the discussing this first time around. Um, the officers just said, and obviously, the officers has to use that kind of language in saying that um, refusing this would be a bit harsh. Um, my view is that we gave one, and one specific reason for turning it down last time. They have come back and addressed that one and that one specific reason to turn this down tonight. I mean, good part is an understatement, they've done all that work, and to specifically address the issue we had, and my view is they have addressed it, I don't think we can turn this down now, we've proved more than a bit hard to be kicking the teeth. Um, well, I, at a previous um, planning committee, I think it was Council Ward, was referring to uh, the, the problem we have that we shouldn't turn something down just because we wouldn't want to live in it. And I think he referred to some places that he'd lived in in the past, which I think we were we were planning to uh, turn down something similar. I've lived in a, in, a, in a basement flat, which was absolutely fine. Um, and it seems to me I couldn't possibly vote that somebody else shouldn't be able to have the opportunity to live in this flat just because I might not want to live in it nowadays. So I think we should uh, we should go for this. Uh, I certainly intend to vote for it. Okay. Do you still have yeah. I just to make the point, I worked out it's around 17 and a half square metres of amenity space, which sounds okay, does it not? I mean, we would work on five metres per actual room for a flat, um, so it, it's more than that, it's less than what we want for a house, obviously, but it, it, in the circumstances, yeah, it sounds okay. That's okay. That okay. <coughs> the next one to the vote then. Those in favour, please share. Those against, not voting. Recommendations carried. Okay. If I can just draw your attention to um, a late letter from uh, the applicant, which I believe has been circulated um, for the meeting. Um, and um, the um, uh, modifications um, sheet. Um, you'll see again the reasons for this being brought um, before committee um, is the uh, range uh, and number uh, of objections um, that have been received. Uh, the proposal in this instance, uh, again, uh, the uh, formation of uh, one uh, additional um, dwelling. Um, you'll see um, from the officer's report that there have been um, a, a whole host um, of uh, objections uh, raised um, in, in this particular um, instance, um, some uh, relating to um, planning matters, um, others um, uh, relating to uh, matters such as um, impact on, uh, uh, on property um, values. Um, but again, th this is something where um, there's uh, some considerable planning history 
um, and uh, that uh, may well um, uh, have a, a bearing on the um, uh, on the input that we have from, uh, from residents um, in, in this particular instance. Um, the planning history that's set out in uh, the uh, officer's report um, takes you back to um, 2015 when officers first received um, proposals for um, uh, a detached dwelling uh, on the site. And if you turn to page 128 of the, uh, the report, uh, you'll see that that was uh, refused for uh, some fairly broad um, reasons. Um, uh, with really um, design being uh, one of the um, key aspects uh, that officers cited, the proposals being um, considered quite out of context um, with its surroundings. We then move on to the scheme uh, in 2017, uh, which was for the erection um, of um, uh, a two story end of terrace dwelling. So, effectively, I can take you to the photographs of the, of the head of the cul de sac, effectively extending this um, uh, pair of uh, semi detached uh, drones by uh, really a, a, a jelly mold um, addition at the end to provide rather than a pair of semis, a, a short terrace uh, of three. Um, at that time, um, officers felt that the proposals would be um, out of context. Um, with this part of the Haint uh, Walk street scene. Um, but in response to that, although the application went to um, uh, appeal, and although the appeal was dismissed, the planning inspector um, was um, less than supportive um, in terms um, of um, the impact of an additional dwelling in this particular location. Um, and you'll see halfway down page 128, um, the uh, planning officer is um, taking some text out of the um, inspector's um, letter. And it notes, however, uh, it would be in a secluded position with restricted visibility from the street. In this regard, any loss of symmetry within the site would not be readily, readily perceptible from along most of Haint Walk. Um, the design of the proposed dwelling would also be consistent with the existing semi detached pair. Um, for that reason, for the, for the above reason, I conclude that development would not significantly harm the character and appearance of the area. So the inspector uh, here is um, still refusing uh, the proposals because of the um, perceived impact on neighbouring properties, but isn't, isn't so much saying that putting an extra uh, dwelling in this location uh, would, um, would necessarily be, be harmful. Then we move on to uh, a 2018 application, which again officers have, have, uh, have refused. Um, but in that particular instance, if I can take you to the, the plans for the, uh, for the site, um, and if you see where the hand is circulate, circling um, here, the red line which runs pretty much north um, south and creates a modest but adequate garden for 58 was in fact orientated along the rear of the proposed dwelling um, and then run, ran uh, off in um, uh, an easterly direction. So you had um, pretty much a, a stubby L shaped garden with the first floor windows of the proposed property looking straight down into the garden um, of um, 58. That application um, has also gone to appeal and we're awaiting the decision from uh, the planning uh, inspectorate. But in the meantime, uh, the applicants have put in um, uh, this latest application, which will now be the fourth application um, on the site, uh, with an arrange, a different arrangement to um, the uh, garden boundaries. So now the first floor windows of this property would look down um, onto the reconfigured um, back garden, um, which would mean that it would be no longer looking onto the garden of 58 Haint Walk. The changes to the front of uh, the property at first floor level are such 
that the windows for the bedrooms would look eastwards into this large garden area and there would be obscure glass to a higher level, um, again roughly where the hand is, is moving, so as to avoid a loss of privacy towards the back of 56 paint walk. The setback is also significant. The setback is around one and a half metres from uh, the front of the property. And again, that was one of the issues that the inspector did fix on, and that was the visual impact of this additional dwelling on the amenities um, of uh, 56 Hain Walk. So, through a, a series of, uh, of steps and amendments to the scheme, um, the applicant has now come forward with um, proposals which, in terms of um, their impact on neighbouring properties, would appear to have addressed um, officers' um, concerns. Um, the scheme is different in as much as um, it's not um, entirely the same as the scheme that was before the inspector when the inspector refused permission, where the building aligned with the front of the neighbouring um, property. And again, um, it's, it's a matter of judgment as to whether or not the new roof um, form um, is successful. Um, but again, given the inspector's comments regarding the buildings being tucked away and secluded, it's debatable whether or not, uh, again, a slightly um, disjointed um, uh, roof form in this instance would carry such weight as to um, uh, get the support of an inspector as appeal. So as a consequence, notwithstanding the objections that have been received or the reasons that the council has up until now cited in terms of seeking to resist the proposal, as I said, through a series of steps, the applicant has now got to a position where officers feel but it would be unreasonable to withhold permission, and therefore, permission is recommended subject to conditions. Um, I have a question, two questions actually. One of them is on process. Um, if we, if, um, I hope you don't have a problem with answering hypotheticals. Um, if, you, if we pass this, give approval for this this evening, and the appeal lodged on the decision made in November is then successful, would they in effect have two valid planning permissions for two slightly different schemes on the same site and could choose which one they wanted to build? Um, and secondly, as the appeal, I understand, is on a delegated officer decision, um, and this is a question I'm not sure you will be able to answer, do you have a level of confidence in that appeal upholding your initial decision. Um, Chair, um, if members were minded to approve this scheme and the inspector allow the appeal, then yes, there would be two different permissions that could be implemented um, on the site. Um, I'm sure you'd appreciate I, 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 I can't really second guess um, how an inspector will approach this. Um, it was quite disappointing that um, the inspector took the view that actually putting in another dwelling um, in itself um, and how that affected the symmetry of what's actually quite an orderly um, uh, municipal um, housing layout um, uh, could work. But we had to, to, to shift our, our, our position. Um, but I would like to think that the inspector could see um, sense in, in, in so far as the scheme that we have uh, refused did have windows looking straight down into um, uh, this um, uh, this garden. Uh, and um, my recollection uh, was that the configuration and layout of the rooms was such that if you relied solely on obscure glass to um, maintain your um, uh, natural light um, uh, from this side of the building, then really you, it would be like, um, well, you, you wouldn't really have a, an outlook from those um, rooms. You, you'd just be looking at obscure glass. So the, the flip side to that is remove the obscure or remove the obscure glass and put the windows somewhere else. But because of the way in which the previous layout was configured, that in turn would give rise to overlooking. 
And so that's why officers felt we had to refuse the scheme. Any other questions? Councillor Lincoln. to uh, not bother about the conditions that we put on if, uh, if they decide to go with the evil one. Do you understand what I mean? If we, if we make the decision tonight and we put some extra conditions on the document that are not on the, the other one, then not only does he have the choice of um, which one to take to do, he also presumably can choose the one with the conditions. Well, can not. I ask what extra conditions you're talking about? Pardon? What extra conditions are you talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to mention some. I've got some conditions about road and down, but possibly on the other one, anyway. That's not a fan mission, is it? No, I mean, the, um, and the documentation that I was reading with residents was talking about hedges and fences and all sorts of things. And the the actual entrance to the to the properties. If you go back to your original picture of the site, mm. then you've got that entrance to get into 58, 56, mm. and above, which is which leads to repairing and so on. That would put the top of the planning condition or not. Yeah. Um, chair. At the moment, I suppose I can understand why, why members may be a little bit um, apprehensive uh, about um, endorsing the, the revised proposals. Um, as I've said, the way in which the garden was configured running um, in this direction on the last scheme meant that the key thing from uh, officers' perspective was to ensure that the windows didn't overlook um, that garden. Now, the, the, the new proposals could allow perfectly clear glass uh, along here. But again, it would be rather um, perverse to, to put a condition or to suggest an additional condition is put on for the first floor windows that somehow they should be obscured glass in case the garden layout wasn't as per um, the drawings. The fact of the matter is the inspector will be asked um, or will be required to make his determinate his or her determination um, based um, on uh, the um, submitted plans and nothing else. And whilst I can appreciate that residents may feel that uh, the council's um, processes in terms of enforcing um, planning controls are perhaps not as speedy as they may like. Breaches of condition are um, matters which um, uh, planning officers will um, pursue um, quite properly and if it's considered that uh, a breach of planning control is such that it results in material harm as a result of perhaps direct overlooking of a garden space because the garden boundaries haven't been properly um, configured, um, then uh, a breach of condition notice would be served um, and appropriate in, uh, enforcement action um, would follow. Counting. Uh, I wonder if you can give me clarifications on this point, which you think is what I've heard you say. The, the property at the moment, overlooking number 56, there's a uh, there's a 100% privacy guaranteed with the existing arrangement as it stands at the moment. Is that correct? <clears throat> Chair, as things stand, the building that my hand is circling um, on uh, the plan uh, doesn't exist, and therefore the windows at first floor level in um, 58 look simply towards either the flank wall or the corner of the front of 56 um, Haint Walk. Um, and, and so, uh, in, in that uh, respect, 
there's not even a, a, a sense of um, uh, that everything because this building simply doesn't exist. Um, if there are no further comments, I'm going to move it to the vote. Is that okay? Um, those in favour of the recommendation, please show. It's unanimous. Okay. Then the recommendation is approved. So we now move on to agenda item 12, which is land adjacent to 65 Sherman Park Road. Again, 
Rootham is a parcel of land just beyond this, which is free from uh, development. So the accommodation would look towards that. And then if I can just go back a little bit further. Yeah, you can see some distance away is the flank wall um, of the nearest house in, I think it's Brampton Close. Um, so again, no issue there with um, uh, overlooking or, or loss uh, privacy. In terms of the size of the units, uh, the proposal to meet the national um, standards, um, in this particular instance, the applicant has provided um, uh, a lighting uh, report, a, a report to assess the light that would get into uh, the accommodation at um, uh, basement level. Um, and what the report um, does is looks at the key criteria, um, vertical sky components, average daylight factors, um, uses um, a recognised methodology used by the building research establishment, um, and again, um, comes up with um, figures that would suggest that the proposals would meet um, nationally recognised um, standards for um, good levels of uh, natural light. Again, in terms of uh, garden space, two modest gardens are proposed, but the two units um, would comprise flats, so in that respect, the proposals would provide um, gardens well in excess um, of GLA's um, minimum standards. In terms of parking, there's no uh, parking provided um, on site, um, but um, the area is not one considered to be um, suffering from um, parking stress. So again, the absence of parking would not be uh, a sound reason to refuse um, permission. Uh, cycle storage is provided, refuse stores are provided, um, the basement um, has been uh, assessed in terms of um, Structural um, integrity, and you'll see there are uh, two conditions, or there are conditions uh, proposed to be attached uh, to a decision. Um, and again, uh, permission is uh, recommended subject to conditions. Questions? No questions? Comments? Goodness me, that can't answer itself again. Yes, sir, so no. No, it's just the I don't think there's anything we can probably do here. It's just a shame it couldn't have been one decent sized family house rather than being split into two flats in this one. It really is. So if you look particularly at the rear, it, 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 those small rear gardens are going to be all, all fences and bin storage, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Chair, if, if I can just say that the proposals had all, the site had been the subject of um, pre application inquiries and that had been. Suggestion. No further comments? Okay, we'll move to vote then. Those in favour, please show. Those against, and the recommendations carried. Um, we now move to agenda item 14, which is planning appeals. Um, this is just a note. And we had one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten dismissed and five allowed. Note that and the plan enforcement um, report, agenda item 15, again. Any issues anyone wants to raise? I think Jonathan will take them back. No? Okay, well now thank you very much for your attendance this evening.